Well, hello there, beautiful teachers. Welcome back to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. This is your weekly show every Wednesday, where we talk about latest goings on in the music teaching industry, what's happening, and we dive into a special topic each week and we generally hang out together. It's a lot of fun. So if you're joining us for the first time, please say hi, hello and welcome in the chat. If you are new, you haven't met me. So my name is Nicola Canton. I am the creator of VibrantMusicTeaching.com, which is a membership for music teachers of all stripes to great get great resources and training for music teaching. And you also may know me from my blog, which is Colourful Keys, ColourfulKeys.ie. So if you are new, say hello in the chat. We've got lots of returning faces coming in here, which is great to see as well. For our warm up today, those who are returning will know we often do Rhythm Railroad and Sulfur Railroad as our little warm up together. And don't worry, they'll come back next week. But I had a special request this morning from a member who is here in the chat. Hello. And we are going to take that suggestion. So we recently released Inside Vibrant Music Teaching. We released a set of tracks, which are called, the resource is called Big Box of Blues Tracks. Does what it says on the tin. They're all tracks, backing tracks for improvising in the blues. So we're going to play around with one of them today. Right, so I'm going to stick on the track. It's a backing track, so it's designed for you to improvise along with it. You can do it as technically or as non-technically as you like. So our backing track designer has built these to have an interesting chord progression that you could over time figure out, your students could figure out. But you can also just mess around on top of it using the blues scale. So if you're at a piano or you are vaguely near one, go there because it's more fun to, I think, to play on a piano or on an instrument that you have. If you don't have those things on hand though, see if you can improvise with your voice. I want you to give it a go, okay? So I'm going to improvise over here. I'm going to mute myself though because that would be distracting. So I'll be improvising here and you'll be improvising at home. Now these tracks are on the longer side for our backing tracks because we really wanted to give enough space and time to improvise, to come up with stuff. Sometimes our improv tracks are a lot shorter. These ones are on the longer side. And when I thought about doing it on the show, I thought, hmm, should we cut it? Should we do a few of them as a little taster? Then I thought, no, we're gonna do a whole one track. The reason we're gonna do that is because that's what I like to do in lessons with students. Because with these tracks, when I put them on for students, about halfway through, they might give me a little sideways look like, Am I supposed to keep going? And it's not because they're bored, it's because they've meet, reached that moment where they're like, they thought it was going to be just a little thing and then we move on, and it's turning into more than that. And often it's after that sideways glance at me, like, hey, are we really, is there more? That's when they come up with the really good nuggets. So we're going to do the whole track. It's about three minutes. Play around with it, mess with your voice or on a piano or on a flute or whatever. It is... E, it's in E flat, so you can use the E flat minor blue scale as the simplest option. So that is all the black keys plus A. Okay, let's give it a go.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you gave it a go. You were just watching me and listening to that track. You should have given it a go. Next time, next time, you'll dive in, right? <laughs> I know, by the way, from the side especially, I don't always look like I'm having fun when I'm playing. It's because I'm thinking, I think, and I haven't tried to like make my play face more pleasant. <laughs> yes, because I feel like that would be false. Anyway, so if I look a bit like I'm bored or something, that's just my face. Helen, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, it definitely, you get into it more and more as you go on and like it repeats itself, but it changes the patterns. I really like the way they're constructed. So there are 48 tracks in that pack. If you're wondering, there are all 12 keys and four per key. So there's actually two different styles at two different speeds in each key. So it's a lot of scope for playing around with it and getting to know all of the uh, blue scale. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Lisa. That's awesome. Vocal improv over there. I love it. Yeah, I had a lot of fun too. It's so much fun. Make sure you make the time to have fun with these things, especially if you are newer to improv or nervous about teaching it. Do it yourself. Like really just dive in and do it like you're a student. It doesn't have to be something spectacular or amazing or like technical. It can just be nice. Um, Tanya, I tend to approach the blues scales, which I don't do with other scales, but for the blues, I tend to just go by like the semitones. So I make sure a student knows it in one key, E flat is the easiest, and then I just have them count those semitone patterns and figure it out in a new key, practice that key load, count the semitone patterns again, like if they need to, and do it again. So they don't need to memorize the semitone patterns right away. But by the way, that the semitone is a half step, in case you're not familiar. But that just means, you know, they're not going to remember every single scale <laughs> right off the bat. So I think the blue scale is one where I very much give them a pass to figure it out each time. They just know one and then they figure out each one as they go. Um, Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Okay, we're going to dive into our main topic. Today, we're going to be talking about the power of preemptive music theory. This is a term that I coined myself as a way to describe what I was doing in my teaching. I'm sure you can find similar approaches that are named different things, but this is how I talk about it. Before we take, get to what preemptive music theory is though, I want to talk about the opposite, because this is what I see the most option, often. I call this the all at once approach. Here's what I mean by this. This is how we often approach pieces mostly based around how they're laid out in method books. So sometimes we call this turn page teaching, although sometimes it looks like different things. It's where we literally turn the page in a method book and we see or we knew already that staccato is introduced on this page. Um, we introduce what the staccato is, we show them the symbol, we make them repeat the name or write it down or something like that. And then we talk about the new piece that uses staccato and we try it. Oh, uh, Helen says she's hearing the backing track. Anyone else? That's weird. I don't know how that would be. Okay, I'll try. Just muting those things, see if that helps. Um, so yeah, all at once approach is where we see the staccato on the page. We look at this new piece that uses staccato and then we put the student to work learning that piece, right? 
So what is wrong with this? Well, in a way, this makes a lot of sense. You might call this just-in-time learning, right? So this is where we're going to use the thing that we've learned right away. And that makes a lot of sense. And this is honestly how I learn a lot of things in my life. Like if I'm going to learn a new software, a new program, I don't read a manual. I don't watch a tutorial video. I think that's a waste of my time. I figure out what I want to do in the program first. I figure out how to do each step of that thing. And then I repeat that process until I know my way around the program pretty well. That's how I approach learning new software. But the issue with doing that in piano, in my opinion, is because we're asking students to do too many things at once. It's all at once. We're asking them to recognize this symbol, learn to recognize the symbol and differentiate from the other symbols, to learn a new term, staccato, to perform the physical action, the technique required for this, which is going to be new as well. And we're also asking them to read a brand new piece of music, which if the student is just now learning about staccato, well, they're probably going to still find reading a new piece quite challenging in and of itself. So I just think we're asking too much at once. And it can make students really easily frustrated. Let me know if you've seen this in your studio or if this is how you approach things and you think it works great. But this approach is something I've gradually moved away from more and more. It's not something I never ever do because sometimes it just happens. There's something new and they need to learn this new piece that uses it. And that's just the reality of the situation. We can't plan for everything. But wherever possible, I like to instead think about preemptive music theory. So here is how I, my little definition for preemptive music theory. Students should meet a concept, symbol or term away from the piano before they are asked to play a piece that uses it. This is a little rule that I try to teach by as much as I can. Not perfectly, not every time, but as much as I can. And generally, this is what happens in my studio. Students meet a term, a symbol, staccato and the staccato, the look of a staccato note, before they play it at the piano. It's really a simple idea, but it takes some planning and some forethought. But it does make a huge difference to how confident students are using that term. Let me know if you've experienced this with a student where they've met something away from the piano, for example, in a game, using a manipulative, that kind of thing, before they then have to play a piece using it. And ideally, a few weeks before. Now, I am not saying that sound before symbol is wrong. A lot of people think that when I bring up this preemptive music theory idea, because I'm saying meet the symbol before meet the sound, but I'm not actually. I'm saying meet the symbol before you meet the whole reading process <laughs> and the whole playing a piece process. But it actually doesn't contradict sound before symbol at all. So here's how the ideal scenario would look in my studio. A few months before, the student would listen to pieces that use this thing and talk about it with me. And they would do movement activities that incorporate this new idea, especially for things like rhythm or dynamics or lots of other things that come up in music like that. So that's a few months before. Then a few weeks before, they are starting to improvise, to play around with it. They're experiencing with it on the piano and the sound of it without having to read it or even perform a rope piece which has specific things to remember. They're just making music with that thing. So they're using staccato notes to play an improv that's about hot sand. And then a few weeks before as well, also a few weeks before, we're playing games or doing manipulative bass activities that introduce them to the look of the thing. So they've met everything separately before they finally are introduced to a piece that uses it and have to put it into action whilst also reading a new piece of music. Does that scenario make sense? 
Does that sequence make sense to you? Is it something you're already doing? Maybe instinctively, maybe you've worked on this. We really, I think, need to do a lot of planning at first to put this into action. But over time, it can become a lot more instinctive. So there's two easy ways, I think, to get started with this. Number one, if you're a member of Vibrant Music Teaching, you can use our roadmaps. If you do the roadmaps, if you follow our roadmaps, say with um, some of the popular method books like Piano Safari, Piano Adventures, Piano Pronto, or using my Thinking Theory workbooks, if you follow those mode roadmaps and just stay one step ahead of where your student is in the reading, you will naturally be a few weeks ahead of each term. It'll just happen and it'll be easy to structure. If you feel like you want to create your own sort of roadmap or sequence that helps you do this, one simple way is to just go through your favorite method book in your teacher copy and write down what new term is coming up in each page and then flip back three or four pages, maybe a chapter even, and write down those, the term you want to introduce and the game that introduces it or the activity you want to do that introduces it. And then through the listening stuff where we're talking about a few months before, that's something if you generally incorporate listening activities into your lessons and movement based um, music activities, you will naturally introduce a lot of the musical elements as well. So that is preemptive music theory. Now it's a simple thing to explain. I hope you've understood it and it's made sense to you. And I hope it makes sense in terms of the pedagogy as well, because to me, it makes a huge difference. It's a simple thing, but that doesn't mean it's easy to implement. So don't beat yourself up if you can't do it right away. If sometimes you do turn those pages and just go, a sharp, I better teach them about sharps because we have to learn this piece this week because they've got nothing else to practice. That will happen sometimes. But if you start to build these plans for yourself, you will learn so much about the student's learning process, about the sequence of things that come up in method books you use or your normal teaching materials, and maybe some places where you want to adjust that sequence where it doesn't feel right to you to teach the things in that order and you can swap them around and start to make things your own, start to really come up with your own custom curriculum. Okay, for my uh, asking anything section, I am wearing a diving mask today. I don't have a reason for that. There's nothing, to, no special January theme. I just thought it looked funny. I hope you enjoy it too. So please do ask me any questions you have. Now, remember, we're also giving a prize away. I'm going to do that after I've answered the questions here. So um, do keep your comments coming in and make sure you stay live because you'll need to be live to be eligible to win the prize. I'm just going to pick someone at random from the chat. So the more times you've commented, the more likely are to win. And I'm going to do a little spin the wheel to decide what they're going to get, but you have to be live to be able to claim it. Okay. I'm going to scroll back because we've had a few comments there. Rachel, can this work for new notes too? So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here, Rachel, and correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like you mean like introducing say D, middle D, for example, you don't mean note values or something like that. Personally, I don't introduce notes one at a time. So that, that wouldn't come up for me where I'm just like introducing D and then introducing E. I don't work that way. We, we read based on intervals in my studio. And when I do introduce students to all the notes on the staff, I should backstep. We do landmark notes while we're doing the intervals. Well, uh, when I do introduce students to all the notes on the staff, we do in one big go using the skip self about we don't go note by note. So having said all that, yes, it could. <laughs> it's the real answer to your question if I've picked the right question for what you were what you were writing there. Um, yes, it definitely could. You know, they've met certain notes in a game and then they come across them in the piece and it's that much easier to decipher it. But I prefer to work based on intervals. Uh, Carrie, yes, absolutely. Games are great based on this. Um, and Juliet, yes, nice. Exactly where they really come into their own in our studio too. 
Mushka, yeah, pretty much for all ages and levels. I would say maybe not for your more advanced students because in general, they have met most of the things on the page. So that new reading experience is not so overwhelming. Um, and my music theory I'm covering there is more general view, working on theory that they won't meet in their pieces even, like SATB or stuff like that, um, and working on really a theory curriculum, working based off of that. But in their pieces, say they open up, I don't know, a Chopin prelude or something. They've met most of the things on that page. There might be a new term that they haven't met before, but most of the things there they have. So it's not the same kind of overwhelming experience that I want to avoid. Oh yeah, that's another great way to go about it. So if you follow curricula of ours, like the Piano Power Booster, this is what will happen. You will get ahead of things because that's kind of because you're skewing yourself towards more, you know, games and improv and stuff that you might have included otherwise, and it has this trajectory to it, they will have met most things before they meet them in the method book, naturally. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could all do more of it. I'm not perfect, I don't claim to be, but it's something I aspire to. I would use the term, but I wouldn't uh, expect it from them. So I would say, okay, we're, I want you to play piece, uh, your notes like this in this piece because it's supposed to be hot sand, if that's the example we're using. And I'd have them to describe it to me first. What am I doing differently? How do the notes sound? What does my arm look like? And can you imitate what I'm doing? And then I'd just simply say, yeah, and that's called staccato. And then every time I use that term going forward, I would say, Okay, I want you to play those notes staccato. Remember these are the ones that you thought looked like a trampoline or whatever word they use. So I'm connecting the two together, but not necessarily saying, um, what was this called? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely have mentioned it here and there. This, um, this, There's a blog post that just came out on the site and a podcast episode and now this video because I realized it was one of these things that I had mentioned several times. I'm, particularly in emails actually that have gone out to people but not so much codified on the site and made it really clear what I was talking about so uh, the lovely Joanna from the team <laughs> pointed out to me that I hadn't made it super clear so I decided to <clears throat> yeah they've already met the concept and they gain confidence in the idea of doing new pieces as well you know you have those students who really are very tentative about new pieces and stuff like that they definitely gain this confidence that like yeah when I start a new piece I can normally do it because a lot of the stuff is not new um, and that'll be more and more true as they go through even without this preemptive theory work yes Tanya that's a great point so when things pop up in a lesson when you do turn the page and realize oh I forgot we have to learn sharps <laughs> in order to do this piece but they have to do it because they're doing a duet with someone else or whatever then yeah a mini preemptive thing realizing that at the last minute but then quickly pulling out a game or something to introduce that to them away from the piano even if it's right before um karen okay there's different roadmaps so there are the specific ones that go along with specific books like um, Piano Safari, Piano Pronto, Piano Adventures and Thinking Theory. We have four of those. So those are going along with the books. They don't include every games, only the ones that are relevant to the concepts as they come up in the book. So if, for example, there is a game that uses the key of B flat and that isn't covered at any stage during that method book, that game will not be included on the plans. The main roadmap, though, the one we just call the VMT roadmap, that includes all the games ever. So I would never expect a single student or even a teacher across all their students to use every game. But it gives you a suggested order so that you can quickly look at it and say, okay, this student did this game before. Maybe we want to do the next game or a few games down. It gives you some inspiration and also just gives you that complete list of everything we have. Hope that clears that up. Uh, Lee, okay, so introducing the new thing using listening. This is really can be as simple as, you know, 
playing pieces regularly for your students, playing tracks or playing them physically yourself and talking about them. A lot of rope pieces that my students learn, we would have um, listened to them together before they get to learning them, for example. And when we're listening, we're talking about, oh, what happens at this point? Does it get louder? Does it get softer? So that's a student meeting what a crescendo is because they figure out it's getting louder and it's happening gradually. So it's really just about chatting about the music that they are maybe experiencing anyway. <clears throat> oh, that's great to hear, Lisa. Awesome. Um. Oh, <laughs> that's so funny. Yes. I mean, it's not funny, but... um. I'm glad it's somewhat on theme in some way, although I wish it wasn't for your sake. The Skips Alphabet Pam is, um, I think, from Piano Safari. So we do teach it in VMT, but it entirely comes from the Piano Safari book. It is introduced at the start of Piano Safari book two. It's just the idea of instead of going with like uh, mnemonics or things like that, or just going with landmarks and insisting that students work out each note every time, which works for some students, but not for others. Skip's alphabet is taking the pattern of F, A, C, E, G, B, D and applying it across the whole grand staff lines and spaces over and over. But um, yeah, if you are a member, you can check out the game Face Gibbity. I'm just going to grab the link for you because it'll be very quick. Um, face Gibbity, Gibbity Face. I'll just put it in the chat for you and if you grab that game go to that game page if you remember then the game helps you teach it but also there's a video on that page where I am teaching it to a student and I'm really going through the whole process so hopefully that'll be helpful <coughs> excuse me oh good Rachel I did answer your question properly that's great Student confidence is huge, isn't it? Especially when you have, when you meet those students who are just really ungritty, who give up really quickly and because they just don't have that faith in themselves, it can be so hard to get over. So, Mushka, we are not at the piano for all of a lesson. I will say all of my lessons are not there are longer than 30 minutes but even when i was teaching 30 minute lessons we wouldn't be at the piano for that whole time however with only 30 minutes you have to be clever about how you use that time so you you only have time to play one game i'm not saying you can do more than that and you might need to make it a quicker game you know that it only takes a few minutes but if you put that cleverly in the middle of the lesson you'll find your student will focus better for the rest of the lesson anyway so you will make up that time actually if you move fast uh, in terms of like you set up the game while they're already playing something and you already know the n rules like you know what you're doing there's no faffing around time you can do a game in three minutes five minutes and if you take that time in the middle of the lesson even for a 30 minute lesson the student because of their attention switching um their brain will have to work that much harder and they'll actually learn more in the rest of the lesson time that they are playing rather than sitting there kind of switching off over time if they're say repeating a piece or whatever so that's part of it um you wouldn't necessarily have to introduce a number of new concepts each week though because are you going to play pieces that introduce multiple different brand new concepts in one week usually not maybe two yes but often none, and sometimes two, and usually one. That would be my estimate for you in most good method books. Because we don't want to be moving so fast that a student can't possibly keep up with every new thing they're learning. Um, part of this is, though, if you have students in a pre-reading stage at the start of their studies, they don't have a lot of new things to meet. They have a few, but not many. And so we're using a lot of that time to get ahead on a lot of the staff stuff. So where you do have a lot of new things to learn is when students are starting to read on the staff. They have to learn what a treble clef is, what a bass clef is, you know, intervals, landmark notes. We do all of that while they're also doing pre-reading music, which is pretty instinctive for them, most of them anyway, and rote music. And so, yeah, the, the beginning, they're learning the piano keys and stuff like that. And then they're still doing pre-reading practice to really get solid with that. 
but we're starting to work on staff concepts. And going forward, you know, we would only really have new things every few pages in a method book, for example. Carrie, yes, absolutely I am. We're actually going to have a booth this year. We're going to have a table. So, um, but I'm going to be floating around. Mostly Sarah from the team is going to be managing the table. So I'm really excited to be there. It's going to be so much fun. If you're coming, I cannot wait to meet you. That is so exciting. Um, good opportunity to mention that I'm also going to be at MTNA. So MTNA is in Reno, Nevada in March. I'm going to be there. And then uh, NCKP is in, well, not really Chicago, Lombard, but Illinois. Uh, in July, last week of July, and I'm going to be there as well. So both of those, two trips to the US this year. Very excited. And one trip to Canada too, because I'm going to be in Canada in September. Lots of trips across the Atlantic this year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Lee, I kind of answered that answering someone else's question in a way. Uh, how much time are you spending on this preemptive idea? Because basically a lot of the theory work we're doing is preemptive. Almost all of it. Occasionally we're reviewing and stuff like that, but I wouldn't dedicate a certain amount of time, but I would say generally the game we're playing is usually to preempt something. So, uh, three to five minutes for a shorter game. If I have buddy lessons, we might be playing a game for ten of those minutes, cumulatively. Um, Rachel? He does not. <laughs> he does work in the business. Uh, he works for Vibrant Music now, but he works on like fun stuff like the financials. And he also does uh, video editing, podcast editing, that kind of thing. And a lot of other helpful things. Cutting out games is something he's doing this week. So yeah, uh, lots of different roles in the business, but he does not play music. He understands bits and pieces, obviously, through just being around me and the work that he's doing um and he occasionally gets an idea to learn an instrument but he picks it up for like you know a week or two and then he gets distracted again <laughs> um oh sorry what day will i be presenting at nckp oh sorry that's the previous question that's why i was confused um Hoping to be there. Do you know which day I'll, you'll be there? I don't know which day I'll be presenting. I don't even know if I'm presenting a regular session. I don't think so because they haven't gotten back to me. Uh, but I am doing a showcase. So they haven't given out the timetable for those yet. I will be there the whole time though. So if you're just hoping to say hi, <laughs> you can come on any day if you're only coming one day. But I don't know about which day for a, an actual session. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? A lot of people are like, oh, how did you do that? I'm like, it's great. It's amazing. I don't know how you would find this to be a problem. It's not like we work in the same room or anything. You know, we have enough distance, but we work great together. Um. Okay. Nice. Lots of different approaches coming in. Okay, we're going to do a prize drawing. I'm going to randomly scroll up and down in the chat. If you have final tiny questions, I can answer them after this. But I'm going to randomly scroll up and down. I'm going to close my eyes uh, to do it and then land on someone. And they're going to be our prize winner if they put their hand up and say, yeah, I'm still here. OK, so here we go. I should have some music. Oh, let's just have the blues back on. Jen, Jen, are you still here? Just say, yay, if, I'm, if you're still here, or I'm the winner. And if not, I'll pick someone else. And then we're going to do the spinner. You know what I would love to get? I was thinking, this is putting this together. I'd love a real big spinner. It's probably like, it would take up so much space. Hi, Jen, you're still here. Awesome. Uh, like one with like the, the wooden spokes or whatever you call them around the edges that like t -t 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 -t. I'd love that anyway that's my dream for the day okay congratulations Jen we're gonna spin your wheel here we go oh you got winner's choice okay so winner's choice Jen you get to choose and you can email me with your choice you don't have to choose now 
The options are a thinking theory book, that's a music theory workbook. You can get a digital single license of that. You can get our calendar template, playful practice or pensive practice, which are digital practice cards with practice ideas. You can have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom with me if you like, or you can get a digital sticker. So you just email us. If you already know which one you want, let us know. If you're like, what? I don't know between these things, then let us know that either. Our email is support at colorfulkeys.ie. And I'm going to put that in the chat right now. If you just copy that and email us, Jen. You're our first winner. Congratulations. Yay. Okay. So that's going to be our fun new tradition each week. I'm going to pick someone at the end of the show. You can win multiple times. If you happen to already have the thing that you win from the wheel, then we'll give you another thing. No problem. I hope you enjoyed our first show back for the new year. Happy 2023 again. And I will see you guys next week. Bye.